Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. A measles outbreak centered around Portland, Oregon, and neighboring Vancouver, Washington, has sickened more than 50 people, most of them children. 47 of those infected were never vaccinated against measles. There have also been measles outbreaks in New York and Texas. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends that children receive measles vaccinations in early childhood. And while most children in the U.S. do get the recommended vaccinations to protect them against infectious diseases such as measles and mumps, recent CDC data have found that a small but growing percentage of young, very young children aren't getting their shots. In fact, the rates of unvaccinated toddlers appears to have quadrupled in the past 17 years. For all of us, and especially infectious disease specialists, the skepticism regarding vaccines is of huge concern. So joining us in studio to talk about vaccine for kids and to give us an update on the flu season as well is Mayo Clinic infectious disease specialist, Dr. Napuni Rajapaksi. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Rajapaksi. It's good to see you again. Thanks. It's great to be back. Good to have you here, Dr. Rajapaksi. So it's pretty common knowledge now that the children uh, in the Northeast and other parts of the United States who have gotten measles were not vaccinated. Yeah, so with this uh, current outbreak and what we see in most of these outbreaks that happen uh, sporadically across the United States is that a vast majority of those who become ill um, are people who have not received the recommended uh, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Um, Occasionally, there are some cases in people who received a single dose. Uh, We know a single dose of MMR vaccine is about 93% uh, effective. Two doses are upwards of 97% effective. Um, But by far, the majority have not received the recommended uh, routine vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella. And the increasing resistance to vaccine is uh, being guided a little bit, a lot, maybe by social media. Yeah, so uh, we see uh, a lot of information on social media regarding vaccines. Um, Obviously, some pro-vaccine and some uh, anti-vaccine. But uh, a lot of people are now getting their health news, their medical advice, uh, their scientific news through social media. And so as a medical community, we really have a responsibility to make sure that it's accurate uh, information that people are getting. Um, The interesting thing about social media is kind of what you see is also reflective of the kind of uh, engagement that you have with posts. And so if you have already an anti-vaccine kind of slant, uh, you will be presented with uh, information that kind of confirms your views. And so that's one of the big concerns. Um, And it's been quite interesting in the last few months to see uh, some of these big uh, social media groups kind of recognizing this as an issue and starting to take some steps in the right direction. Where's this misinformation coming from? Do we know? So the misinformation comes from a variety of sources, um, kind of dating back to uh, the article by Andrew Wakefield in the late 90s, which many people still kind of bring up as a reason uh, that they are hesitant about vaccinating their children. We know that since um, that article on MMR vaccine and autism came out, we have had numerous uh, numerous scientific studies uh, that were well done that have shown absolutely no link uh, between the two, including a large one that was just released last week, Uh, the largest uh, study in a Danish population, um, over 600,000 children, that again confirmed what we we knew before, which was that there was absolutely no link between MMR vaccine and autism. But those types of uh, pieces of information have a way of kind of working their way into the psyche, and there are people who have profited uh, from kind of spreading that information, including celebrities and other people um, who have gained a following for their views. And so... Um, that can be very difficult to kind of change. What's your reaction to this? I uh, read recently that despite the measles outbreaks in, across the country, at least 20 states have introduced bills this year that would broaden the reasons why parents can exempt kids from getting vaccines. Yeah, so that is just staggering and very disappointing, I think, as an infectious disease specialist. We know that these infections are preventable, and that's really taking a step in the exact wrong direction. Um, There are states that allow uh, philosophical and religious uh, exemptions uh, for vaccines and to try and expand those even beyond that really uh, exposes our our kids to these life-threatening serious uh, illnesses for really no reason at all and so it's very concerning uh, to us thankfully many of these won't get passed um, but uh, the fact that they're even out there or being proposed is really of huge concern I don't even know if I want to ask about the Russians (laughs) (laughs) is there anything to the fact that that's part of the misinformation piece 
So there have been some articles that have come out recently suggesting that um, some of the misinformation is being spread or amplified kind of by bots and all these uh, things that wow. can post things on social media. Um, so I think it's definitely a possibility and really is not doing anything to, to help get good information to parents who are trying to make these decisions. Are there some children uh, for medical reasons that should not get vaccinated? Yes. So there are some uh, legitimate med medical reasons why uh, some kids should not receive vaccines. These are primarily centered around the live vaccines. So that's your measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and your varicella or chickenpox uh, vaccine. Uh, children who have weakened immune systems, whether they've had an organ transplant or receiving chemotherapy, uh, things like that, uh, those children would not be eligible to receive those vaccines because they are kind of live weakened versions of those viruses. Let's talk about some measles myths. Sure. Uh, one of them being that antibiotics will help you. So don't get the shot, but then just get antibiotics if you get if you do get measles. Yeah, so that's a complete uh, myth. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no antibiotic or antiviral that works against measles. The only care that we're able to offer for that is what we call supportive care or dealing with the symptoms that the child may have. Um, and we know that there are serious life-threatening um, complications that can develop from a measles infection. About one in a thousand kids with measles will develop encephalitis or brain swelling that can leave them with lasting uh, effects. Or death. And one to two in a thousand can die from the infection itself. And so um, very serious complications that are just completely unnecessary in this area, era where we have something we can do to prevent these. More myths? Um, more myths, I guess, are that uh, measles is not that contagious. It is, in fact, one of the most contagious infectious diseases. Um, the virus particles can remain suspended in the air for up to two hours after someone with measles has left. And so you never even need to come face to face with someone with measles to contract it. And uh, if exposed, 90% of people who are unvaccinated will develop infection. And so that's why um, it is such a difficult uh, infection to control once it has taken hold in a community that does not have uh, immunity to it. We promised our audience we'd ask you about the flu season. It's peaked. So um, we this has been an unusual year for flu. So uh, what we're seeing this year is uh, an initial wave of H1N1, which seems to have peaked uh, in the northern hemisphere. Um, what we're now seeing kind of on the tail of that peak in some areas, especially in the south, was a second wave of H3N2. Typically, we see one or the other in each season. This year, we're seeing some early indications that we might actually have both in one season, which is unusual. Um, and so we're waiting to see kind of what happens in uh, this area in the north in Minnesota. Um, but it's been a bit of an atypical year so far in other areas Tr of the country. Treatment if your child gets the flu? Anything special you should do? So... Um, there are there's an antiviral available for treatment of flu called oseltamivir. Um, not everyone requires treatment. We require tr we recommend treatment for people who are at high risk of developing complications. So that would be uh, definitely children under two years of age. Children under five years of age may have a higher risk of complications as well. Uh, pregnant women, uh, people with uh, compromised immune systems or weakened immune systems, uh, the elderly, um, or people who have underlying heart, lung, or neurologic diseases. Um, the otherwise kind of average healthy person with the flu will probably recover um, on their own. And in that situation, we recommend kind of symptomatic treatment. So Tylenol, uh, ibuprofen, um, lots of fluids and, and rest. Tough it out. So how long uh, are you contagious? When can you go back to work or school? So uh, people with the flu are usually contagious for about a day before they even themselves have symptoms and generally lasting for up to a week after onset of symptoms. Um, young children or people with weakened immune systems may actually be able to transmit for longer than that. All right, infectious disease specialist, Dr. Napuni Rajapaksi, there is no question in your mind or ours that vaccines prevent serious diseases and deaths. It is truly unfortunate that based on non-scientific information, some parents are choosing not to have their children vaccinated. Measles, for example, as you have mentioned, can be a serious disease, can even be fatal. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Roger Poxy. Thanks for having me.